Thank you, Dan. Um, I also want to thank you. I'm honored to be here. I'm, I'm, I thank you for, I know it's the end of the afternoon, so uh, people I'm sure are tired of speeches. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, and, and I hope what I have to say is carries some interest. Um, I want to set up, start out by setting up the, the Silicon Valley, uh, uh, the basis for Silicon Valley, and, and it has to go back to Stanford University. Um, it is in the center of Silicon Valley, and it's been there for only 125 years, but that's about the length of time that Silicon Valley has been active in, its, in, in, in the startup scene. Um, and one of the things that I, that the reason I mentioned is because it set the mindset for so much in Silicon Valley. Um, when it was started in 1885, the Stanford family established the object of the university. And it wasn't to do research for the betterment of the society or world. It wasn't to produce a faculty that was the finest on earth. It wasn't even to, to educate students. The objective of the university was to qualify its students for personal success and direct usefulness in life. There's no other major university in the world that has that as, a, as its objective, and it means it means there are lots of different, the, the results are clear um, over the last 125 years as to what that uh, leads to. Uh, so many of the, of the successful uh, people in, in, the, in the Bay Area have gone through that, that training mindset that Stanford instilled in them that it makes a huge difference when you're talking about startups. Um, then the, so, so I was fortunate enough to be not the founder, but one of the co-founders of one of the companies that's, that's been quite successful, which you know about. EA Sports, it's in the game. So, I think that's familiar to all of you. Um, one of the things that, that's, that's been a topic running throughout this, this uh, conference, this uh, um, Founders Festival, has been the idea of courage. I don't know how many times uh, people have defined what courage is. Uh, I wanted to give you a few definitions of courage to start out with. Courage. What makes a king out of a slave? Courage. What makes the flag on the mast away? Courage. What makes the elephant charge his tusk in the misty mist or the dusky dusk? What makes the muskrat guard his musk? Courage. What makes the Sphinx the seventh wonder? Courage. What makes the dawn come up like thunder? Courage. What makes the hot and top so hot? What puts the apron apron cut? What do they got that I ain't got? Courage. Courage. You can say that again. Hmm? Okay. So the point, the point of, of that is that I have to add that for all of you startup muskrats, that are uh, needing to guard your musk, you should, I think, be encouraged by the fact that you already have what it takes. Um, and, and courage is, is derived from Latin for the heart. And that's really what, what, what's most important in, in anything, is putting your heart into it. Um, courage isn't uh, fierceness in battle. It's, it's, it's pursuing things with your whole heart. Um, and in terms of the founding of Electronic Arts, there were six of us that uh, came together. Uh, in July of 1982, we had dinner at our ringleader's house, Trip Hawkins, and um, not one of us knew how to code anything. So um, we were all marketing people. If you, if you can notice, uh, Tripp was a, a Stanford, uh, Harvard undergraduate in, in stri uh, strategic gaming. Uh, he was a Stanford MBA. I was an anthropology undergraduate major at Stanford and had a Stan got a Stanford MBA. Bing Gordon was a Yale English major, also a Stanford MBA. Rich Melman was a Berkeley physics major with a Stanford MBA. Dave Evans was a Stanford mechanical engineering undergraduate and master's degree. No, and Pat Marriott was a managing, uh, marketing manager at Apple Computer working for Trip. So we didn't have any coding experience at all. Um, 
what we did have was some marketing experience. I'd been in charge of, uh, at Atari, I was the only one in a, in a video gaming company at the time, but I was an executive in charge of uh, European and Middle Eastern business development for Atari's home computers. So we got together and talked about the, the kind of company we might want to be a part of uh, that, that evening at, at Tripp's house. And then in August, we all left our executive positions and joined together to start the company. We had nothing. We didn't have any products. We had some dreams, some missions, a mission to help uh, create experiences via a computer, a home computer, that mm, people hadn't been able to have before. At that time, home computers were primarily used for word processing, for um, spreadsheets, maybe for calendars, some fairly mundane things that were just um, um, data-driven. We wanted to create experiences that, that nobody, that in, in the entertainment side of business, that you couldn't have um, in any other way in your life. But we had some challenges. At that time, um, the, the retail situation was a computer shop, individual mom and pop computer stores all over the country, spread out, not connected to each other. And we decided we were going to sell directly to those computer stores once we had a catalog of, of, of uh, titles to, uh, to offer them. Uh, we sent our people out across the country, the United States, finding uh, titles that were independently developed. And we, we did publishing deals with them. Uh, everybody told us we were completely crazy. If you can see, here's the inside of a computer shop. This is the way things were displayed. The, the uh, marketing of, of anything in a computer store was horrible. Uh, so we had that challenge to face and, and we had to figure out how to do that. I'm, I'm going to show you to this afternoon a few clips of videos, of, of a video that we made in 1983 and just listen to what we were saying in 83. Um, that was 34 years ago. Um, it, there's, it's still relevant today. In order for us to do what we uh, are trying to do, we have to be obsessed, and we have to be a little bit arrogant, and we have to be a little bit cocky about uh, having a sense of possibilities that, that are open to us that aren't open to others because of our convictions. And if we didn't feel that way, if we didn't even have a little bit of a sense of uh, not knowing what we don't know, and... Uh, you know, if we, if we were too conscious of the pitfalls, if we were too conscious of the obstacles, we might uh, lose our uh, conviction. And uh, we really do have a sense of, uh, of really being obsessed with it and really believing that we know how to do it better than everybody else. And, if, and that may seem arrogant, but if we didn't feel that way, we wouldn't be able to pull it off. And it's because we feel that way that we're going to. Okay, so that was 34 years ago as a, as a, a founder of, of the company. We all shared the, that attitude. We were putting our hearts into this, this enterprise. Um, and I, I was the uh, executive director. I founded the uh, accelerator for UC Berkeley for startups uh, about five years ago. And um, this is the same mindset, the same attitude that, that founders in, in Silicon Valley anyway still express when they're talking about what they're about to do. It's the same... Um, same set of issues, same set of attitudes. And, you know, Tripp always used to say, um, you know, it's not arrogance if you can do it. And, and we ended up being able to do it. What we had to face in the culture of, of, of Silicon Valley at the time was this. This was California culture. And, you know, games were not taken that seriously by people. It was kind of silliness. Um, we had to figure out a way to get away from this, this image of, of, of California and and somehow or another work into a more serious uh, attitude toward um, uh, games as, as, a, as a business. So our, our first ad was of this photograph put together by the same guy that did the photograph of the, the Beatles here. Um, he's a LA photographer. We went and found him, brought all of our independent artists together, the first ones that we signed, and had them pose for this photograph. And the, the, this was a, a, the print ad, the first print ad we ran, and its title was, Can a Computer Make You Cry? 
Well, at that time, we ran this in Newsweek, a big consumer magazine, and Scientific American. Scientific American was just geeks and scientists that were reading it. But it posed, it posed a question and made it uh, caused a, a sort of a different attitude, um, we think, and, and I think it's just proven out true, that it made people think differently about um, video games and, and where they come from. So this is, this, this is not the founders of the company. This is the independent artists. We were going to turn them into, we wanted to help turn them into like rock stars, where they'd have a, a, a following so that each game that they produced, they'd have a group of people that already liked their style and wanted to buy it again, buy another one of theirs. Uh, but we also had some, some, some distinct thoughts about what should be uh, what should be the content and results of video we're games? At the of things and it's just settling down. We, how this business is really going to be run and organized is, uh, I think, Electronic Arts is going to be one of the leaders because of the professionalism of the people that are planning the organization and doing a lot of thinking about the structure of the artist relative to the producer inside the company, relative to the the production and distribution aspects all being, you know, integrated into one package. It's more or less where the thinking's got to be. It used to be just a guy in his garage can start selling. And that's still true today to some extent. But it doesn't go very far. And Budge could tell you, you know, you can try that and you get your family involved in working on it. But in the end, you really need to understand how to market the product as well as develop it. As you can see, that's a young uh, Steve Wozniak. He was on our board and an investor. But the point he's making, and, and he, of all people, uh, was an important one to make the point is that he understood how important it was to be able to market a product since it was Steve Jobs who was the marketer and Steve Wozniak who was really the technician. Um, and so he, he, grab, he had already grasped that by 1983 when they started Apple in 1976. Um, and so he was really encouraged, encouraging to us too to pursue the, the, the ability to market the product. And that, that ends up being extremely um, valuable. It's possible for a computer to provide a world where the rules are open-ended, where if you're flying around a planet and decide to take off toward that star, you can. We can evoke in people a sense of, um, uh, you know, wonder, curiosity, intrigue, um, uh, maybe a little smile for, for a for a grandson who learned how to do something uh, on, a, on a grandfather's machine. I'd like to write some software that interacts with you in a way that's really close to the way a person would interact with you. Uh, you may become attached to some of the software characters and you may um, develop emotional feelings about, about some of the personalities in the software. That's why I've been mentioning the idea of a software friend. And that sort of should be built into a computer, but uh, it can be built into a program too. A lot of good designs just cause you to smile. I mean, you look at it and you want to smile. So these were the ideas that we, that we wanted to instill in, into the population and into the software that we, we published. Bill Budge was the, the artist, the, the creator of, of Pinball Construction Set, one of our first products. Um, and he was in 1983 talking about a software friend. There weren't many people talking about having internally in a computer or a piece of software a software friend. There was no internet at that time. You guys are all too young to remember those days. Um, there was no email, really. No, there wasn't any email. Uh, maybe some local area internal networks, but certainly nothing uh, like we have today. And so the thinking about that kind of thing, have an internal friend in a, in a computer, was, was unheard of. We ended up producing within our first six months uh, and releasing our first seven titles. Marketing was part of that too. Think about how these titles, which were eight inches square, they looked like record album covers, and um, we put these in mom and pop stores all over the country. The executives of the company all set out, we cut out, the, we, we carved up the United States into regions. We, each of the six of us took a region and we spent three weeks on the road driving from city to city, looking up in the yellow pages, computer stores, and, and then plotting them on a paper map and going to each computer store with these products in hand and walking in. I remember walking into a, one of those mom and pop stores and I'd say, hi, I'm Jeff Burton, I'm from Electronic Arts, and they'd say, 
Electronic Parts? I said, no, Electronic Arts is a software company. Let me show you some of our software. And they saw these packages and they all said, every time I went in a store, they said, oh, we've got to have those. So they started out, they'd buy one to go and one to show. Two pieces. <laughs> um, but that was all it took because once their regular customers came in and saw these, uh, these products, and they'd buy them and we'd get reorders. So um, that started the ball rolling. Everybody had told us we couldn't succeed selling directly, but in fact we did. And how do we get from here? This was Dr. J and Larry Bird go one-on-one, -on -one, our first real sports simulation. And look at the characters in that, to here. Of course, that's FIFA football. Um, and that was, you know, to be honest, that was the quality of, of experience that we wanted, that we intended to have in 1982 when we started the company, but it just was not possible technologically. So we had to, it took 10 years, uh, yeah, at least 10 years for us to reach this point, both from a standpoint of technology of development tools, of the bases, uh, the uh, computers or, or game units that could handle this kind of graphic. Um, and, and yet, it took what? It did take courage. We put our hearts into it. Tenacity was another characteristic that we had to have because it took a long time for us to gain penetration in the market, starting as we did with mom and pop stores. We eventually had all the retail change chains in the United States, including Walmart, ended up uh, with, with uh, selling our products. Timing and luck were also a major part of it. So what's next? Um, I happen to have an interest in what's next. It's a company called Holodeck VR. And I'll show you a clip here of, their, of, of our products so far. We're starting out. Oh, homage to Pong. Pong was the first video game created by Atari. But this, you're in, you're in the game. It's, it's, it's not in the game, you're in the game. And you're the paddle, so you have to move back and forth to play it. It's great fun. Same thing with our homage to Pac-Man. Um, you're Pac-Man. You're not playing Pac-Man, you are Pac-Man. You're running through a maze trying to uh, uh, acquire all the gold nuggets that are in front of you and, and keep from getting uh, destroyed by the various monsters chasing you around. Everybody knows how to play it. It's great fun. You're doing it in open space. But it's, a, it's an involvement that you can't get any other way. Um, we've also got a version of Bomberman um, that is, is totally engaging. Uh, when you have the experience, it's, you can't describe it. You have to just have it. Then you understand. That's what's so compelling about virtual reality and gaming now. Um, it, it offers that kind of um, real, real experience to you. Um, and, and that's going to be the future. Th this is just the beginning. This is like Dr. J and Larry Bird go one-on-one. -on -one. It'll get better and better. This is a Mayan uh, multiplayer. We have multiplayers. Each character in here is represented, is, is a player. It's kind of like a free-roaming paintball uh, game. So the future is, we're at the edge, we're at the right at the beginning of being able to break wide open the possibility of experiences that people have never had in the digital world before, with gaming particularly, but with other things too, just experiences. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big world. Um, I have, I'll close with about five lessons that, that I've learned, I think. First one is, is pretty obvious. When you start a company, only select people that you believe are the smartest, most talented people you know. Hire people who you think are smarter than you are. Not your wife, although she may be. Um, not your best friend, but people that, that you know have real talent or that you believe have real talent. Lesson number two is try to make the biggest impact you can possibly think of. Change the world. I'll tell you, I had 
two months ago, three months ago here in Munich, I was talking about electronic arts. Somebody came up out of the audience afterwards and he said, you know what? I want to thank you for starting electronic arts because it saved my childhood. I said, what? How can that be possible? He said, I had a speech impediment when I was a kid. I couldn't play with my friends. They were making fun of me all the time. He lived in India. He was Indian. He said, I've lost that now. But he said, when I was a kid, I'd come home and I'd play um, cricket by Electronic Arts, one of the cricket games. I didn't even know we had a cricket game. But um, he said, I played it hours upon hours, and it was therapeutic, and it made my childhood livable. I thought, wow, that's a big impact. Never would have occurred to me that that would happen. Lesson number three is always be honest. That's the, that's the only way to go, but it's so easy to, to, to forget about that. Even if it doesn't give you an advantage, and let me give you one example. We had the opportunity to buy um, uh, GTA, Grand Theft Auto, uh, Electronic Arts did, and we didn't buy it because it didn't have the right, um, uh, right content for us. Throwing you off here. So, can we get this mic on? Two I know more we're, lessons. I know we're throwing you off. So, it's amazing to have so much wealth and knowledge on this stage <laughs> here. He's got so much to share with you. So, I know you got five. You can go through those two. And then we're going to. Oh, yeah. And then that's, that's about it. All right, super. So, we'll, four. Lots of. This is an important one because not many people mention it. Lots of money doesn't deliver happiness or contentment. Um, you're supposed to follow your passion. That is the whole point. And I can tell you that from, from personal experience. Lesson five is to give back. Um, if you're a startup uh, entrepreneur, you really are the most privileged and fortunate person in the world to get that experience, and you need to share it. Finally, in case the future's so bright, you got to wear shades. Thank you. Hey, amazing. Jeff, thank you ah, so thank much. You,